On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Jaws. And Jaws ended up being married to an extremely jealous, insecure, and controlling abuser. Her story is one of loyalty and trying to be perfect to avoid the escalation of conflict at all costs. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, a podcast that gives a voice to survivors of narcissistic abuse. I am Brandon Chadwick, but my friends call me Chad, and thanks for tuning into this episode. So what is a narcissist, you may ask? Well, for the purposes of this podcast, we refer to a narcissist as anyone who has displayed a pattern of behavior that shows a limited capacity to appreciate others' perspectives. It is that simple. And now, before we get to our episode with Jaws, I just wanted to thank everyone in the Narcissist Apocalypse community for listening to the show and sharing your thoughts by email, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And a big shout out to all our friends on our Narcissist Apocalypse Facebook support group page for just being great people. If you want to join that group, it's facebook.com slash groups slash Narcissist Apocalypse. Everyone on there is pretty friendly. So don't be afraid to show up, post, and answer other people's posts. It's a great time on there. Everyone is helping each other move forward and get better. Also, a reminder, if you haven't left us a review on whatever podcast service you use, Spotify, Apple, Google, Stitcher, CastBox, etc., etc., leave us a five-star written review as it helps out the show a lot when it comes to rankings and the quickest way to be part of our show, that was a terrible segue, but still the quickest way to be part of our show is if you want to read a letter to your narcissist and to be part of our letters to our narcissist compilation episode, we have a voicemail recorder on our website to record. Go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. It's on the right side of the page. It's a floating button. It's hard to miss. It says, send voicemail, press it and away you'll go. We're accumulating these letters for a volume three of that episode. Our recorder records up to five minutes. So if you need to record more than once, record twice, three times, four times, as many times as you need. And if you don't want to read the letter yourself and you want myself or my old pal, Melissa, to read your letter for you, just send that letter into NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com. And in the subject line, type letters to my narcissist episode. And now, before I get out of my own way, a couple of notes before this episode begins. First, sexual abuse is discussed in this episode. It's brief. It's not graphic at all. And second, some bizarre behavior is exhibited by the ex in some description of this episode. The ex is diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And for some with this disorder, if you are unmedicated, some of their accusations or stories may become outlandish. And you'll find out in the last quarter of this episode how crazy some of these accusations can get. So just, you know, we're not trying to stigmatize bipolar disorder. In the case of this person, they might have bipolar disorder and another disorder going on at the same time. Uh, We're not here to actually diagnose anyone, but this person does have official diagnosis of bipolar, and this is actually one of the symptoms. I just wanted to get that out there. Anyway, it's time for the show and for me to get out of my own way here is my interview with Jaws. Welcome everyone to this week's episode. With me, I have Jaws. How are you, Jaws? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good. So with, I'm just going to get out of your way and we're going to start the show. We're going to start your interview. The floor is now yours. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Um... So a little bit about me. I started using um, opiates when I was in high school, mostly just pills. Um, it turned into a, a addiction. Um, I got clean in November of 2011, and I was living at my parents' house 
after um, a split up with someone I was with for a few years that we were using together. So it was a pretty toxic relationship. And um, there was some uh, some abuse in that relationship. Um, but uh, in April 2012, I met my ex. At my parents' house, there's a, a hill that I would always longboard down, and uh, I would turn around into this cul-de-sac um, that's just five houses away from uh, my parents' house. And at the end of that cul-de-sac was um, a family down there that I went to high school with a few of the boys. They were... Um, foster brothers and uh, a foster home. And I never met um, the oldest, which was my ex-husband. Um, he was seven years older than me, so I knew his family, just not him. But one day when I was longboarding down that hill, I went to turn into the cul-de-sac and he was pulling up the road in his car and almost hit me. Um, the next day, I went down to the gas station down the road and he was there and he came up and talked to me and got my number and we, we were inseparable for the next seven years. Things moved very fast um, with most stories that I hear. It was very sweep off your feet and couldn't imagine it being any more perfect. Um, he had the same interests as me, same likes, anything that our values were on what we wanted to raise a family as or... Uh, religious beliefs, anything like that, everything was the same. Um, all of my insecurities about me, or, you know, physically or anything, he loved about me. So I felt like it couldn't be more perfect. Um, so about a month after we were dating, I already moved in with him. Um, things were pretty, pretty good for the first... Uh, first couple months, uh, then things got um, a little strange, I guess. He had already told me how all of his exes were very unfaithful and all of them did something to hurt him terribly, and... So I knew that he had the insecurities of someone being good to him, basically. And basically from the beginning, I had that want to show him that not everyone is like that. He deserves a good woman. Um, so I was always trying to uh, show that even just from the beginning because of knowing those past experiences for him. So so just to clarify for one second for my own understanding, mm -hmm. so w the way he portrayed his exes mm -hmm. was that they were not understanding of him. Is that what you're saying? So therefore you're trying to show that you understand who he is because of where he came from and what he had to deal with growing up? Yeah, um, being that he had a really hard childhood, um, ending up in the foster home when he got taken from his um, biological mom. His parents were both addicts. Um, they had a very unhealthy relationship, a lot of physical abuse that he watched. Um, so... Was this a way of him planting I guess an early seed in you that these are the things that happen to me and they should be forgiven because I'm acting out because of these reasons right 
Okay. It was, yeah. Um, it was always going back to, well, I'm just scared. And, you know, I've, I've been hurt. I'm just scared. So it was always kind of a, a crutch to lean on for him that it was an excuse. And as far as your insecurities that he's uh, mirroring, what were those specific insecurities? Um, just any normal insecurities the girl has, you know, oh, my stomach or, um, I mean, even as weird as like body odor and he loved it. Like it was just the weirdest things, but those things that most people have that are, you know, that you're insecure about yourself on those things. He just, he said he loved. So I never felt uncomfortable in that way around him. And as far as far as your recovery goes or went during this time, was that part of the mirroring as well? Yeah. Um, he was, uh, his clean date was only a month after mine. So we were both clean for about six months. Um, he said he was uh, quite harder into it than I was, but we were both at that uh, just that state of mind, um, so close into our, uh, recovery, uh, that first year, they actually, you know, uh, therapists and things like that, they tell you not to date anyone within the first year of you getting sober. And it's for a reason <laughs> because you are basically relearning everything, um, so we were both at that same uh, mindset, just men- mentally in the same, uh, what's the word? Almost awkwardness of, of getting back into reality. So, um, but yeah, it was a lot of mirroring. Um, whether... It was true or not, I'm not sure, but uh, it was quite a bit of mirroring. And so we just felt like it was soulmates, perfect for each other, meant for each other kind of thing. So with the mirroring that was going on with interests as well as the vulnerabilities, uh, you both had similar pasts in, in the sense of being in recovery and then he, the ex-girlfriend stuff, uh, the kind of things he's saying, planting those seeds at this point with uh, both of these things kind of going on, it, you move in, is your trust with him sealed the deal right there? Or is there any other events right. that occurred after that kind of created that final trust bond? We both wanted just a couple of kids. We wanted to raise them both the same way. Uh, religiously and, you know, how to discipline and anything like that that's uh, the important part of wanting that partner to raise a family with, we both had almost to the T of how we wanted to do that, how it how it looked for us. So once that was done, you, you moved in after a month, and then you said weird things started happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, he would get, he started getting very jealous. Um, I knew obviously of, of the insecurity, but it, it really started coming out. Um, whether it was, you know, if I came home five minutes later than normal from work because I left five minutes later or whatever, he would question if I was with someone else. Um, he would, any little thing that he I mean, he was always searching. Um, it, it started out as just a few little things and, and progressed after that. But um, whether it was coming home late, whether it was my phone, you know, message uh, ringtone going off at 11 o'clock at night or any little thing that he thought he could kind of pull from, uh, he would and he would say that I was sleeping with someone else and it became very, these outbursts were, got bigger and bigger 
and me defending myself, it would become this big fight. And um, the majority of the time, he would say, you know, I'm done with you. There'd be times he would kick me out and put my things on the porch. If it was raining, he didn't care. Um, the next day, it would be, I am so sorry. I'm an idiot. I'm just scared. Uh, you know, I, it was all the sorries. And pull me back in with those promises of, I'll, I'll be better, I'll be better. Things got more bizarre uh, after that. Um, I, I I thought that I had boundaries um, as far as, you know, you will not talk to me in this, you know, disrespectful way. Um, I, I thought that I demanded that respect and um, wasn't going to take crap, but looking back at it now, I definitely should have had far more boundaries and he knew how to push those boundaries until there wasn't any more, basically. As far as, sorry, as far as when these fights are happening and he's accusing you of sleeping with other people, are you saying to yourself uh, ever in any situation, why am I trying to get him back or make him feel better in the sense of he should be the one apologizing to me, but yet you might be the one kind of doing it the other, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're the one doing it on your, like you're, what's internally going on with you when these things are going on? And is there a conflict of what's going on in your heart and in your head as far as uh, like you're trying to prove yourself to him in some sort of way? Right. Yeah. It was, it was always having to prove myself. Um, he would always be the one to say sorry. I, I stood my ground and I was not going to apologize for something if I did not do anything wrong. Um, he, it was always the apologies from him. Um, not saying I'm perfect. Like, yeah, I made mistakes and stuff like that. You know, just in a re- relationship, whether I got too mad and I said something that, I had to apologize for or, but it was always him apologizing for, um, for his actions and his accusations and, um, and how far the fight went. I, I've always wondered if it was, um, a manipulation for him to wanting me to always prove to him or try to at least, um, even if it was, you know, he said that I didn't go to work one day and I went somewhere else. And so I would show him on my phone maps and my um, history. See, I was there. I mean, you can look at it. And it was, I find it odd now that I was the one that, to show him you can look at my phone. You can look through my text. You can, it was never really him asking me, can I look at your phone? It was, I was so willing to just, that's fine. Go ahead. I don't have a lock on my phone that, you know, go ahead and look anytime you want. And anytime he would, I mean, there'd be times that he'd be on my phone for a couple of hours looking through past texts or calls or locations I was at trying to find something. And even if he didn't find anything that was of value, he would completely flip it around and say that I was doing something that I wasn't. Um, If I even went to the extent of putting a GPS app on my phone that he could see where I was at anytime. I had nothing to hide. I didn't care. It made no difference to me. Um, but sometimes GPS isn't exact. And there was a time that he called me in a rage saying, where are you at? I said, I'm at home. He said, no, you're not. I'm looking at the GPS right now. You're at the neighbor's house. 
and was accusing me of sleeping with a neighbor, even though he's 55 and I've never even met him, just seen him on his lawn kind of thing. Just a, he would pull from anything and run with it. And it didn't matter what I did to try to prove or prove him wrong or, like I said, once it was... I kind of got down what I should say to calm him down. So once that happened, whether it was a couple hours later or the next day, then it was him coming back and saying, I'm so sorry, I'm an idiot, and the promises to be different. So in a way, his form of of control is having you in a hypervigilant state of of loyalty and re- like loyalty mm-hmm. in the sense of you're trying to prove yourself all the time of these accusations and you now you're being very proactive in like before the accusations might even you know what I mean get kind of tossed your way yep. that you're already being proactive about it and uh, in that realm of control so like you're already acting so he won't react yeah yeah trying to just avoid it altogether. Yes. And me trying to avoid it, it it didn't do anything because he would, I mean, he was determined. He was never fine. He was never trying to look for me not doing something. He was trying to look for me doing something. And, and you know what they say, it's if you're always looking for negative, you're going to find negative, even if it's not there. And that's definitely what he was good at. Um, when he was in foster care, they uh, it's mandatory to go to uh, therapists and things like that. And uh, he was diagnosed with bipolar. And so I always thought that that's what it was. Um, looking up bipolar online and talking to doctors or therapists. Um, it all kind of lined up for me, um, even down to the accusations of being unfaithful, um, the ups and the downs. Uh, I just kind of, I thought it was all because of bipolar and, so I, I didn't want that stigma around it to be, I always thought, well, it's not his fault and he's trying. And, um, after so long, uh, almost a year together, I told him he, one of the times we split, I said, you need to get on medication. The only way I will get back with you is if you get on medication and uh, you go see a therapist. And so he did. And things actually got better as far as those, um, the ups and downs weren't as drastic and they were more spread out um, with him going to see these therapists every couple of weeks. It, w- it Things got better. Um, it wasn't physical anymore after that. So... I, again, I thought that was what it was, was just bipolar. How much did the diagnosis and knowing that he had a diagnosis play into you forgiving a lot of the situations that were going on? A lot. Um, one thing I was always told and read about bipolar is when they say they're sorry, they mean it. It's not that they're just saying it to say it. They really mean it because they can't control these things. So every time he said sorry, I I would forgive. And for everyone listening, I'm not trying to stigmatize mental illness or, or bipolar disorder. It's just in this specific situation, you know, he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. He could have more than bipolar disorder uh, going on. And be, having bipolar doesn't excuse you from uh, that, um, you know, that behavior. And you, you know, you can work on on those things. And sorry, but I had to stick that in there. So sorry about that. Continue. Where were we there? 
I interrupted. Um, you, you, so the loyalty. He, no, you're fine. He got uh, he he got on the meds and started seeing a counselor. Um, he uh, got a job um, uh, up in Idaho. We're in Utah, so he got a a job up in Idaho, and I stayed at my grandma's house. That's just at the border of. Uh, Utah and Idaho. So he would be gone throughout the week and then come home on the weekends. And um, shockingly, that was actually probably the best time of our relationship with those few months that he was working out of town. After after that, um, he proposed. We ended up going down to Las Vegas and getting married with just me him and my parents in just a a really pretty chapel down there and did all the pictures and everything. And it was, it was small, but I liked it. It was, it was perfect for what I wanted. And, um, we ended up moving to Florida. It was, so it was very isolating, just me and him. We would go to work, come home and that was it. He was, he had a very um, hard labor job uh, cutting concrete. So he was always exhausted working six days a week. So the weekend he just wanted to relax, which I'm fine with. I'm a homebody. I am totally fine just being at home. So it was work and home, work and home, just us two. Things continued as far as the accusations and just the cycle, um, him being or feeling threatened and the big blow up and the sorries and apologies, promises, then it would be really good. Then it would be the, t- the feeling threatened and you feel the tension build and then the big blow up and the uh, sorries and promises. So you kind of get on that, um, the wave of knowing when it's coming, you can feel it. You can feel the tension building. Um, he continued to see a counselor out there. And as long as he saw her every couple weeks, it was, it wasn't bad. I kind of, it was worth it to me to have those hard days because when it was good, it was so good. I couldn't be happier we were best friends. It was it was worth it to me to have those hard days because the good days were were just that good. Can you and, can you uh, talk about the cycle for one second? As far as you could, you said you could see it coming. You knew when the bad things <clears throat> were going to be around the corner. So were you kind of? surfing in a sense you you were on a wave you knew where the breaks were happening you knew how to maneuver around everything you knew you were walking on kind of an eggshells in a way figuring out your path but since you kind of did you ha- you had a map in a way you were really able to map right. them out so can yeah. you can you kind of talk how you figured that out and uh, within those times when those things were getting bad, how did you maneuver yourself around or how did you alter how you were being to, I guess, make your life easier in, in what was going on? Yeah. Um, like I said, when it was good, everything was great. Um, once I could feel that tension, because when you're in it for so long, you, you literally can feel it. it. It's not anything about he said something or he was triggered by something. It's You can just feel it. And so things get really tense. Um, I was pretty much always walking on eggshells anyway, even when it was good, just because you don't want it to go back to being tense and bad. So you're just hoping it stays good. So you're still walking on eggshells and tense, but when that tension builds, 
it, it just gets worse. And so I would, I would really try to do everything perfect. And so there wasn't anything to trigger him to cause that blow up. I would try to get him to talk about like, Hey, I can tell something's bothering you. We want to talk about it. Sometimes he would, sometimes he wouldn't. When he would, it would settle it a little bit. Um, but honestly, it would just make it that the blow up ended up a little bit farther down the road rather than quicker. Um, but it was always trying to do everything perfect. Um, he would want me to text him when he woke, when I woke up, when I left the house to work and when I got to work. And so, I mean, that's really hard to, to keep up with every single day. And if it was, Hey, I, I got to work 10 minutes ago, but I just thought of texting you, then it would be an, an issue. It's, it was constant trying to do all these things to try to keep it, uh, to keep it calm. Um, did you feel like a mom in a kind of a way? I'm sorry. Did you feel like a mom in a kind of a way to him? Yeah. Like that you're, you're, yeah. you know, you're coddling his, uh, vulnerability all the time. I felt, uh, like it was many roles. <laughs> Um, you know, the wife that would do all the cooking and cleaning and cleaning up after him mixed with the wife and then the best friend, the counselor that tried to talk to him and get him to talk about things rather than pushing it down and letting it blow up. And it was, um, a lot of pressure. I, I, I think I put that pressure on myself though just trying to keep everything calm and always make him happy. It was always our world. My world revolved all around him. Everything was about him. And I think that was so, it was scary for me because I felt like if I ever lost him, if we ever split up anything like that, I thought I would be absolutely devastated because my world would be com flipped completely upside down because everything revolved around him. Like I said, I thought it, he was my soulmate. I, I couldn't, everything on my checklist of what I ever wanted in my husband, he had besides the fact of the jealousy and the, accusations and his way of controlling I it wasn't necessarily no you can't do that do this you know controlling uh, directly like that it was the making me feel like I had to do things to prove or um you know if if I wanted to go out with a, a girlfriend and go hang out. He said, yeah, that'd be fine. But if I was out for more than a couple hours, he'd say, where are you? Where, where are you at? Why aren't you home yet? And then I'd come home and it would just be tense. And so I just stopped wanting to. So it was his way of controlling was by me making that choice almost. You had completely lost yourself in a sense of who your, yeah. your own identity of who you were. You were not you anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I don't feel like I lost, um, my confidence or anything like that, but as far as identity and doing things for myself and anything like that, yes, 100%. It was all about him. You keep chasing after that amazing feeling at the beginning, the, how everything is rainbows and sunshine and it couldn't be more perfect. And so when it gets to that point of everything is so good, you hold on to it as long as you can because you, you hope that it'll last, but you basically ready yourself for the next time that it doesn't, that it goes off. 
So I guess after, you know, you're in this cycle, you eventually leave Florida? Yes. So we were in Florida for the four years. Um, Like I said, it was just a constant cycle. Um, It was just us to work and home. Um, Things began to get a little worse as far as um, the abuse. Uh, He would... I didn't know it at the time, but knowing now, he there was sexual abuse. It wasn't anything forceful, um, but it was, you know, if we just had an argument because he accused me of sleeping with someone else or using behind his back, then I'm obviously not really in the mood, and so I would say no to having sex, and then he would accuse me of sleeping with someone, then that's why I didn't want to have sex. Or even if after we would and he'd get up and he would say, you are not as tight as you were yesterday because of this myth around if you sleep with someone or too many people, then you're, you're not, quote, tight which is bullshit, but he would always use that as, oh, well, that's what, you know, you slept with someone today. So it was, it always felt like a test um, to make it that there wasn't a issue with me saying I'm not in the mood or I have a headache, my stomach hurts, anything. I just stopped saying no. Uh, so it, lo- it I lost the, the enjoyment Um, and the want to be intimate with him, which obviously put a strain on the relationship. Um, For me, at least, I'm sure he couldn't care less because he was getting laid when he wanted to, but I I just kind of lost the the drive and the enjoyment in it. because part of you part of you felt coerced into it based upon trying to prove yourself in a sense right yeah yes yep and it would always be the me proving somehow whether it's you know look I didn't go anywhere today or you know just the same things that I would always have to do to prove him wrong and show him that I was loyal. By the end of the four years of being in Florida, the blow-ups and the tension building um, were spread out longer, so I thought things were getting better, and, you know, we can get through this. I see a light at the end of the tunnel. And he came home one day, and he said, I want to move home. I miss family. I miss home. I want to move home. And so... That was the end of 2017. And so the beginning, it was, so the end of February is when we moved. My parents flew out and helped us uh, drive back home. We just bought an enclosed trailer to drive all of our stuff rather than getting U-Hauls or anything like that. So... Um, we moved home and ever since about a year, well, eight, eight months, a year into us being together, we were trying to get pregnant. Um, constant, <laughs> the, uh, taking the pregnancy test, if I was a little late, which my, my periods were not regular anyways, but, um, constantly hoping, wishing, you know, doing the ovulation test and and so forth. And um, about a year before we moved back to Utah, um, I found that I had a cyst on my ovary. So that was what was causing me not to get pregnant. 
I had surgery to remove it. And I thought for sure we would get pregnant right away. But still a year later, um, I thought, okay, I'm not going to focus on getting pregnant. We're moving home. I'm going to focus on moving home. We'll worry about that later. And once we got home, three days after we got back to Utah, I found that I was pregnant finally. And I, I mean, we were so excited. It had been five years now of trying to get pregnant. And it finally happened. And, of course, it was right when we moved back home with family. And I thought that things would get better. Um, That was definitely not the case. We moved in with my parents. Being, you know, states away, it's kind of hard to buy a house. So we thought, okay, we'll move into my parents' house for a few months, find a place, and uh, and move in to a home, our first home we wanted to buy. And after a few months, um, things got really bizarre. And my ex, I, I don't quite remember exactly how he worded it, but basically he was saying he was having the thoughts and worries that I, there was something going on with my dad sexually. And I, at that point I got really good at not taking things personally. Um, obviously it's not, it had nothing to do with me of all of these insecurities and accusations. It was his issues. So I, I really got good at not taking it personally. And I just remember saying, like, okay, why do you think this? And he he didn't really have a reason. He just said, like, I don't know. I just, it feels weird. And um, I just wanted to tell you and, you know, get it out there. And I wanted to freak out, but I just stayed calm. And I, I hoped that it would be dropped and kind of just fade away. But it was the total opposite. And um, he would, being pregnant, and plus we had three dogs. So anytime I would go out in the middle of the night to take the dogs outside, um, if I needed to pee in the middle of the night, anything like that, coming back in the room, if he would wake up, he would be furious and say that I was sneaking back in my room after fooling around with my dad. And it didn't matter if it was one o'clock, four o'clock, he would, it'd be a big old argument. Most of the time he would get in his truck and he would leave. Um, as far as I know, he would go to his mom's house, um, you know, just, five houses away down in the cul-de-sac. Um, he would even look at my Fitbit app and see, you know, oh, your heart rate jumped up at 1 o'clock in the morning up to like 167 beats per minute. And one, I'm pregnant. That right there will mess with anything like that. And two, uh, you know, a Fitbit if it's, not uh, if it can't read your pulse or whatever it is, um, then it'll kind of freak out. Or he would look at my sleep chart and I'd say, well, you know, I was sleeping at this time. Like, what are you talking about? That's not always exact. You could be awake and it wouldn't know. <laughs> it would, uh, so he really believed very bizarre. it. Yeah. yeah he oh, really believed it. Totally. Yeah. Like he has extreme 100%. issues when it comes to uh, jealousy or where his mind goes. Yes. Like it, yes. it, it goes I, hyper, like hyper over imaginate, like it goes into another world of what yes. might happen. Yep. 
I, I never, ever thought that it would go that far. If I even thought that, we definitely wouldn't have moved into my parents' house. Uh, but I was just so hurt that he would even think that of me. Like, he, we've been together for almost six years, and you don't know me well enough to know that that is, like, really twisted. And it was really hard not to take that one personally, but he was a hundred percent convinced. He thought if I was, if I went out to the kitchen and my dad came in, you know, two seconds later and my ex walked past the door to see the doorway, he would get mad and think that I was sneaking like (laughs) middle of the day. But he just thought it was always, and we were always just trying to sneak. Did you discuss this with your dad? Um, no. I I always talked to my mom about things that were happening, um, when, especially when we were in Florida. My mom's my best friend. Um, so she knew, you know, what was going on, the ups and downs. And just like me, she thought it was a bipolar thing. And uh, I, I, I sugarcoated things because I never wanted it to be that they judged him or looked at him differently. I didn't want it to be that when they were around each other, my parents didn't like him because of the things he was doing. So she knew what was going on, just not to the extent. Um, so I went to my mom. So we, we were at my parents' house for oh about a year um i think it was about a year until i finally told maybe about nine or ten months until i finally told my mom and when i told her all she said was oh (laughs) i was kind of waiting for her to like kind of freak out. I mean, that somebody is accusing your husband of doing that to your daughter when, I mean, my dad is, he has the softest heart. Uh, he's a big teddy bear. Like he's, he could never do anything like that. And obviously my mom knows that. So I thought she would be furious, but she just, She just said, no, that just says how sick he really is. Like, he needs help. And I never told my dad, and uh, at least not at this point in time. But um, throughout that year, it it got real. I mean, it was at least every other day of a fight. Um something to do with me sleeping with my dad. Um, I don't know how many times in the middle of the night he would wake up. You know, if he, if I woke up and I turned and, you know, to get comfortable in the middle of the night and he woke up from me moving and then he heard, you know, a toilet flush upstairs, he would assume that it was my dad and I just got back into bed after just anything. It was constant tension and those eggshells were really sharp now. And it was just always, I, I, I could never do anything right. Um, I hardly came out of my room when he was home. Um, we stopped eating dinner with my family. We stopped, I mean, it was, we were in that room if we were home. And you were isolated within your own home and your family lived there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're the home that you grow up in. I, I don't think you could get more comfortable than that. And I was far from comfortable because I never knew. Obviously I don't have control over if my dad walks in the room after me or I walk into the room kitchen, whatever, when he's there and my ex would see like I, the things I could not control is what had me 
on edge so much because I know I can control what I do. I mean, there, I, I stopped, I tried holding it as long as I could just so I didn't have to go pee in the middle of the night. I mean, that's ridiculous. And finally, um, after a year of it, I worked all the way up through my, preg- or my pregnancy. Um, so it was nine months, I'm sorry, um, after, at this point. And I took three months off that I was given for my, my work to, um, to be home with my baby. The week that my, or when I had our son, he was put in the ICU for a week. And so the hospital let me stay in the room for free and just so I don't have to drive him back and forth while also trying to feed him and things like that. So we were at the hospital for a week, and it was the best week. It had been in a really long time for our marriage. And I thought, you know, this could be the changing point. He has something, you know, something bigger for a motivation of either making things work or I, I just tried to tell myself that maybe this could be the, not that we had a baby to fix anything, but it was, I thought maybe now that it's, he sees how good it is and maybe would see me different after having his child or anything like that. But that wasn't the case, obviously. <laughs> um, I got back home. So being home for three months and he was working, uh, it was the winter. I had my son in November and my dad has his own business, um, as pool maintenance. So obviously winter is not that busy. He would do spas and indoor pools, but it's just not near as busy as summer. So he was home a lot more and that obviously made the issue even worse with my ex and, It was, he would come home at 10 o'clock at night after work instead of coming home right after work. He would stay at his mom's house. He would, it was, it was not a good three months. Now, he was a lot better about not making a, you know, big scene or blowing up because we had the baby there. It was just, he wouldn't say anything. He would grab some clothes and he would leave. And it just got worse and worse and um, more often. And finally he packed his clothes and said, I'm not coming back. And he had done that, you know, a handful of times before. And he would come back again after and saying, I'm sorry, I'm an idiot. But, This time he didn't. Um, He went and moved in with his mom. And so he was close. And that was two days before I went back to work. And two days after he moved out, I, my mom said, you have not been this happy since, at least since we had been home in Utah. And that kind of was an eye-opener for me. And not not constantly feeling like walking on eggshells and having to watch every move that I make. And it was uh, it was a big relief for me. And that... That really hit me. I, I think I just knew it was done at that point. Um, how how do you how do you, how do your does your marriage recover after your husband is accusing you of sleeping with your dad? And how is that not going to affect your relationship with your dad and your you know just your family in general? How do you come out of that? And so for, um, I'm sorry, for while we were here in Utah, we were, well, I was seeing uh, a counselor. And about a month before, um, before he left, she had mentioned, you know, he kind of sounds like a narcissist. And I just thought narcissist was, you know, the typical, like, 
conceited and obsessed with your self-image kind of thing. So I kind of brushed it off because that's not really him. Um, and once we split and I went back to her and she said, you really should look into um, narcissistic personality disorder. And when I did, it all made sense. Every, everything just kind of lined up for me. That light bulb went off. Everything made sense. And seeing that he did everything for him, um, I, I already told him he was selfish many, many times, but I just didn't think it really went to that extent, I guess, as a, as it does for narcissists. And being that it wasn't... I, it was real, but we both had different motives for being with each other. His was selfish reasons. Mine was to be with him, and it was just very different. So everything that I learned about it, I, I read books and I read articles and I listened to podcasts and I just dove into it and learned as much as I could to really understand it and know what to do, how to handle it, everything like that. And I really started to fall out of love with him a lot faster than I thought was possible for me. Like I said, I thought I'd be absolutely devastated if we ever split. And I, I, it was a, just a relief, not devastation. When you saw um, him for, once you started doing all that research and with the therapy, when you saw him for what he might truly be, or you saw the mm-hmm. patterns of behavior and what, what might actually be causing those patterns of behavior, is is that part of when you maybe took him off of a pedestal of some sort and you were able yes. to actually uh, critically think in a manner where you're not working against yourself. Exactly. I, I saw him totally different after that. Um, I didn't really see him as the, when he was himself, uh, he was very loving and selfless and such a good person but when he wasn't, we, we called his other side Hyde. When he was Hyde, he was everything opposite. I mean, so selfish and hurtful and manipulative and deceiving. And it's really hard to set boundaries with someone after you don't have them. And we, uh, the accusation still came around and... Finally, a couple months after, I just said, I am done. I, I can't do it anymore. I realized it was never going to be any, any different. Like I said, it's, it's really hard to get boundaries with someone after you don't have them for so long. And I, I just didn't see it that we, I'd be able to have those boundaries with him and gain that respect for him to see me as someone that's not going to sleep with anyone, especially their dad. I just, I didn't see us coming back from it. And I called it, called quits. And he, it was the next day that he said, well, I've been talking to someone. I found her on Facebook. We went to high school together. We've been talking for a couple days. And I was so hurt. Um, I just told him to leave. And a few days later, I could not get a hold of him. And um, at this 
point, he had bought a fifth wheel trailer and parked it on his uncle's property uh, for him to live in because he didn't want to live at his mom's anymore. And so I went down to his trailer to go find him, and he wasn't there. So I tracked his phone, and he was out in the town where that girl lives, the one that he said he was talking to. And he stayed there all weekend, and I was devastated. I don't even think it's a strong enough word. I was absolutely crushed. Years of being accused of sleeping with someone else and always trying to show that I was loyal and him never seeing it. And he could turn around three days after I tell him that I'm done and go out and sleep with someone so quickly. I, I really saw him for who he is at that point. And he was coming over to take our son for the day. Um, so he took our son and he left. Um, he was supposed to bring him back about 7 o'clock at night. Tried calling him, and he had blocked my number. Um, was not answering me from my mom's phone, my sister's phone, anyone's. So I just kind of waited, and I said, okay, maybe he is bringing him to my sister who watches our son while I work. Uh, maybe he's going to bring her, him to her in the morning. So the next morning I went over and he didn't bring him over. So I drove out, which is an hour away to where his now girlfriend was living. And I got a sheriff. Um, when I got there, he was at work. So our son was in her care and she was somewhat civil. She was saying to the cop, you know, well, we have a reason to believe that she's using, that's why she, you know, he's not giving him back. And he said, well, you need to go through CPS for that. Like, you can't just hold her son. And so she got her stuff together, and I was leaving, and and she was on the phone with Hyde, my ex, and... She said, I don't know. I don't know. My uh, my address is protected. So he thought that he was taking our son to her house where I would not be able to find him. But I was so furious that he was so willing to do that. He went and bought him clothes and diapers and food. And, I mean, he thought he was keeping him for a while until I could go to court for custody. And so my lawyer told me not to let him see him. Uh, sorry, not to let him see our son, um, at least take him. I told him, I said, if you want to come see him, you can come to my parents' house and you can see him as long as you want, but you cannot take him. And so from him being served the divorce papers, I... Waited the 21 days that he is given to answer and to contest if he wanted to. Um, he never did. So the divorce went into default. So a week later, judge signed off and we were divorced. And I could have asked, I mean, I could have said that his truck was mine, his car, his motorcycle, um, I, I could have taken him for everything, but I was very fair. I said, my car is my car, your truck, your bike, your car, you have it all. It's yours. We split, I split the, uh, medical bills from having our son straight down the middle. I was very fair and I just said I wanted to be done. Um, so in September, the divorce is final. Um, I 
think for me, holding that boundary of not allowing him to take our son was good as far as having boundaries. Um, but he said, well, if you're not going to let me see my kid, I'm not paying you anything. So he stopped. We had come up with an amount um, just for him to help, you know, with formula and food and, or, I mean, um, uh, clothes and diapers and everything. So he stopped paying for anything. Um, he has not paid since. And now it is January. So that is... Um, that is uh, difficult, not having that help financially. Um, it's it's gotten better now. I think he's kind of out, done with that anger stage, but he he still to this day will go in the waves of him and his girlfriend are very. She's uh, very insecure as well, and so. She thinks of these bizarre things that he was saying to me, and it's kind of funny how karma comes around and bites you in the ass, but he has tried multiple times to come to me and say, you know, I get it. Now, knowing what you went through because of what she put me through, I get it. I'm sorry, and, you know, can we please make this work, and... And I just keep telling him, no, I, I can't do it. I am i don't see you the same way anymore. I will always love you because, I mean, you're my kid's dad, but I just don't, I don't see you the same. And then he'll kind of get mad and we'll only talk about our kid for a little bit. And then when it gets, Hectic and he breaks up with his girlfriend, then he'll come and be nice to me and, oh, can I come watch a movie with you guys? And I just want to see you guys. I love you. And it's a very, uh, it's still the roller coaster. But as far as co-parenting, it's actually going pretty well now. Um, he just a few days ago went out of town to Idaho for work. So I'm hoping that ORS will get with the employer and so I can get child support and get some help financially. Um, as far as him taking our son, he gets him one night, um, one weekend, and then the next weekend it's, he gets him for the day on Sunday. The next weekend it's one overnight. Um, and then he sees him, you know, for a few hours on Wednesday with him being out of town, it'll be different, but I'm willing to just let him take him when he's home. Um, but it's actually going a lot better than I thought it would. And how are you doing? So I'm, I'm actually doing really well. I started going back to the counselor that helped me get sober. Um, he is an amazing counselor. He, his ex is actually a narcissist, so he understands it. And he is really helping me. Um, one thing I never thought of, he said, you need to you need to find out what your boundaries are before you set any. If you don't know what your boundaries are, you don't know what you're setting. So you got to kind of figure that out about yourself, what you will accept, what you will not, um, how to hold that boundary and not let them push it. Um, so I'm just, I'm learning a lot about myself. I realize now that I don't think I've ever had actual boundaries with, Men, at least. Um, I, I was, uh, I'm kind of surprised by that, but I, I just don't, I don't see in past uh, experiences with boys in high school or anything, I just didn't really hold my boundaries like I should have. And so it's a lot of learning about myself and things are actually going really good. I, 
I never thought I would be this happy when I was with him and never thought like if, you know, if, if we ever split, I'd be devastated. I never thought that I'd be this happy. And I, I think that's where it is for a lot of people that are in a relationship with that sort of abuse is that they are so scared of that unknown feeling like they would never be happy without them or just the, that fear of the unknown and feeling like you would lose everything and I hope that if someone is in that situation that you love yourself enough, as cheesy as that sounds, you love yourself enough. If you have kids, you, you protect your kids from that because they're most likely going to turn into someone just like their dad or mom, whoever it is and get out and better your life for you and your kids because it's so much it's so much better outside of it not having to always for my situation at least not always having to prove and keep someone happy and it never working kind of thing I am finally doing things to keep myself happy and focus on me and it, it's really nice well, Jaws, I want to thank you for being on the show today. I think a lot of what you said is going to help people out there, especially those who are still in situations like yours, uh, feeling less alone and that you were able to make your way out. And especially there's the, the parts when you were talking about the waves of abuse and the patterns that you were following that a lot of people, I'm sure, within their situations are dealing with currently um, in the way that you maneuver around them. I'm sure a lot of people out there are going to find a lot of common ground with what you said and hopefully they take yeah. what you said and, and have a uh, gain a little bit more strength, even though they're, they're already strong for being in the relationship for so long to get the extra strength to, to figure a way out. And also, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being part of this and for helping everyone out there as well. And for everyone listening, thank you for listening and being part of this as well. And have a good night. Mm-hmm.